Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17. You shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourself, stand you still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. I want us to go back to verse 15 so that I introduce my subject from a scriptural basis. And he said, Here can you, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. I want you to look at your neighbor, and if you are watching online, on TV, please look at your neighbor. If you don't have a neighbor, you look into your screen and you talk to me. And I want you to put, to point your hand on your neighbor with, with such arrogance and audacity and say, you are not going to fight this battle. The battle is the Lord's. Amen. You will not fight this battle. You will not fight. Do I have anybody here who has been fighting something bigger than them? I came only for you. When you're fighting something bigger than you, the answer is that battle is not yours. That battle belongs to the Lord. You're fighting something that you still have options to change and tackle you fighting something that you still have strategies as answers you still fighting you fighting something and your money can still bail you out no that's not the the the, the, the word I, i'm bringing to you today you you are not part of this although i will include you in the midst of the sermon i'll find a space for you <laughs> but if you are fighting something bigger than you i want you to know that the battle is not yours. It's not your battle. Again, for the last time, turn to your neighbor with so much arrogance. Do it with arrogance. Have you ever seen arrogant people? I want you to do it with so much arrogance, but with zest. And I want you to point at your neighbor and prophesy to your neighbor and let the neighbor also prophesy back to you. And I want you to say, Don't fight somebody's battle. Don't fight someone's battle. Don't do that. It's not your battle. It's not your battle. During the week, there's been hot politics in the United States of America. And uh, the news have been overtaken. The COVID pandemic has been ignored now and shelved. It's all America, America, America. And I've seen people from Zimbabwe, Malawi, Nigeria, getting involved with so much emotion in the US election. And I have a word for you, whether you are in DRC, you are in China, you are in South Africa, What's happening in the USA is not your battle. You are not from New York. You are not from Florida. You are not from Washington, D.C. You are from Yazura. <laughs> so the battle is not yours. Don't fight somebody's battle. So I'm going to introduce a battle 
this afternoon that you are facing, that you're going through, or you may face and go through, but that battle is not supposed to be fought by you because it's not your battle. And I'm going to connect you to the owner of the battle. And the owner of the battle have sent me as he sent the prophet in Second Chronicles to remind the king that, King, please don't fret because this is not your battle. It's not for you to fight. It's not for you to fight. It's not your battle. So I want us to go to Exodus chapter number 23. And Exodus chapter 23 is hundreds of years before Second Chronicles 20. Because Second Chronicles 20, we are with the fourth king of Judah. You know that um, King Saul became king and ruled Israel for 40 years, died, and David took over and ruled until he was 93 years old, died, and Solomon took over and ruled until he was a very old man. And King Solomon died and the kingdom was split into two, Israel and Judah. And Solomon's son took over Judah and the generals took over Israel. Uh, his father's lieutenant actually, or his father's chief army general took over Israel. And then he died and his son took over and the son died and King Asa took over. And King Asa gave birth to Be Jehoshaphat and is the fourth so these are, it's, it's almost 500 years plus since chapter 23 of Exodus is um, written. And um, I want us to go back then to hundreds of years before Second Chronicles. And I want us to start from verse 27. And those who are watching online, Please make sure you, you have enough data. If you don't have enough data, you rewatch, and because this this is serious stuff. This this is a message from the files of heaven. I will send my fear before you, and will destroy all the people to whom you shall come, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs unto you. You know, God is just, but is not fair. There are some people he seems like he gives them a little bit more love than others. And it's so ironic because unlike John, the disciple Jesus loved but was humble enough not to mention his name. Unlike Job, um, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to be saying this because I'm one of those people who God loves a little bit more. <laughs> you know, in, in every polygamous settlement, the, the one who is really loved more than other polygamy partners knows it. Knows it. Russia knew she was loved more than Leah. And Leah had to pay Russia at some point so that she has her husband for only one night. So, in every polygamous establishment, somebody is loved more than somebody. That's how it is. So, God has got billions of children, but this verse looks like there are some people he loves a little bit more than others. And that person could be you. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because Satan does not fight anything that's of no value. And your level of warfare determines what you're carrying. And your level of battle and opposition shows that you are loved a little bit more. Second Corinthians 12 from verse 6, because of the abundance of the revelations that God gave to me, a thorn was set in my flesh for a messenger of Satan buffeted me day and night. Not only day, but even when he was sleeping. It was a continual buffeting. He buffeted me day and night. You know, one thing that I give up, I give it up to the devil. Don't misquote me, okay? Don't put me on TikTok. 
one thing that I give it up to the devil is he's so persistent. He's so persistent. I went to school at a boarding school. My whole secondary education was at a boarding school. And I was a scripture union boy through and through. And a Pharisee. And a Pharisee, I was the chief justice of the courts of heaven in the little church called Scripture Union. Checking and checking and judging and passing sentence. Because I was coming from a legalistic neo-Pentecostal background where I had been taught the moment you do something wrong, God is coming to whoop you. So I believed whenever you do something wrong, God is ready to whip you and I didn't want people to be whipped, so I became a Sadducee. But I learned something from other clever boys at school, because we were the Bambi, the, the Bambi. Those who were born after nine, before 1970 may not understand what I mean when I say Bambi. In Shona, Tistataka Pusa. Yes. So I discovered at the boarding school when a boy likes a girl, and the girl doesn't like him, but is waiting for somebody else to ask her out. She likes somebody else, but somebody else who she doesn't like wants her. And or she, she, she wants no, no one at all. When I discovered at a boarding school, the boy would continually harass and harass and harass the girl until she capitulates and she says yes. So someone will start on a girl Form one, first term. Then she'll say yes, form four, third term. <laughs> she'll, so the girl would then bow down to pressure because the boy was persistent. And Satan works just like those boys. Revelation 12 said his job is to accuse brethren day and night. He doesn't rest. When is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. It's continual. It's continual. So, Paul says, a messenger of Satan was said to buffet me day and night, but he then set a good, 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 good stage for us. Because he said, I cried unto the Lord. Not once, not twice, but three times. Why three times? Because... The devil is coming continuously, so it has to be morning, afternoon, and evening prayer. You have to pray always without ceasing because we have an enemy who is persistent always without ceasing. We have to engage God on everything. Your daughter wants to relocate to, Blue, to Botswana. Please, you, you, you go through God first. Someone wants to borrow money from you, you go through God first. You want to borrow money from someone, you go to God first. A church boy wants to date you or wants to marry you. You go to God first because just because he's coming to church may not mean he doesn't have a devil because the devil also comes to church. So I've learned through pain that the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord and whenever I took my own steps, I paid the price. So Paul says... This guy's persistent, so I also became persistent. I'll come back to that chapter later, but here is somebody, a nation that's loved by God a little bit more, because God is saying, all your enemies, I'll turn their backs unto you, and he's saying, all the people you meet, I'll make you destroy them. How many wish this message could be theirs that Anyone you meet and hates you, anyone you meet and is plotting against you will be destroyed by God just because he doesn't like you. I love that God who whips everyone who doesn't like me. Muroi, be careful. <laughs> you may be messing with the wrong person. You may be messing with the wrong person and I, I feel the, the spirit of prophecy overtaking my sermon right now because I wrote a book Arabic, Africa religion a blessing and a curse and spiritual people and Christians don't like don't want to read it because it's talking more about demons than about God yet Jesus 
spoke less about angels than he spoke about demons. I was counting how many times Jesus spoke about angels and the times he spoke about demons and I was so scared. He spoke about demons 19 times than he spoke about angels. And he spoke about his father lesser times than he spoke about hell. And he spoke about hell over 30 times. Why? Because Jesus loves people so much he doesn't want any one of them to go to hell. He loves you so much he doesn't want anyone to be oppressed by the devil. So he revealed the mystery of unclean spirits. He revealed, he's the first person to tell us there are some things called unclean spirits. John didn't. The prophets didn't. He's the first person to tell us that they are um, evil spirits, then they are wicked spirits. Then he's also the first to tell us that there is some spirits called the strong man. Then he told us also that Satan is the prince of this world. The Old Testament never said so. But Jesus said, the prince of this world is coming after me. And he also told us about his conversation with Satan after 40 days of fasting. Three times. On the mountain. In the wilderness. And at the top of a temple. But we have a church that's so choreographed to only say God is good all the time and all the time God is good. And yet they cannot explain why her daughter is behaving just like your late grandmother who your daughter never saw. Just like your mother who your daughter never spent time with. Just like you even though you won there against your own mistakes. And how then would you describe your great grandmother who fell pregnant at 14 and your grandmother who fell pregnant at 15 and you who fell pregnant at 16 and your daughter who is now pregnant at 17. How do you explain that when there is no book or manual in the family which says when you are 18 you should fall pregnant for something who only used half of his mind? So Jesus answers those questions that the church nowadays no longer answer. But 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 says we are aware of the devil's devices. We are not ignorant. So we wrote the Arab book so that people who claims to be prayer warriors of this nation may know how to shoot. Because people pray for sugar. People pray for bread basket. People pray for rain. But they don't understand what's praying against them. So if you don't know your enemy strategy against you, how then would you counter strategize? Because some things are not in the realm of prayer. Some things are in the realm of discipline. Some things are not in the realm of prayer. Some things are in the realm of love. Some things are not in the realm of prayer. They're in the realm of knowledge. A marriage, marital differences are not in the realm of prayer. You don't pray over marital differences. Marital differences are in the realm of knowledge. My people are destroyed because they lack knowledge. The man doesn't know how to treat this type of a woman and this woman doesn't know how to respond to this type of a man's madness. It is lack of knowledge. So everything has got its own way of solution. And Arabok was then to position Africa to understand the source of the real problem of the black man. The black man has real problems. Has real problems. But it's time that the black man shines because Cain kills Abel in the field and he, he thought no one saw him and yet God in heaven heard the voice of Abel crying but Abel no longer had a mouth. The mouth was now in his blood. He said, I heard the blood of Abel crying. Could it be that the boy who was killed in winter when one hooligan police officer stuck his knee on his neck and the racists were saying it doesn't matter but everyone who is concerned was putting one knee down and one hand up and was shouting black skin also matter. Could it be that the blood of that man cried and right now somebody who many people 
outside America didn't like is now the president. Okay, he's not yet the president and want to be called a false prophet. Maybe the, the Supreme Court, they can change things. But if he doesn't become the president, the good that has just happened now, now, the joy they're experiencing in these few days, could it be that someone's blood is cried to the Lord and say, God showed them that black lives matter? So, pastors and prophets and prophetesses are praying and praying and calling angels from Africa and South America. I salute them. They are my fathers in the Lord. I salute them. But sometimes it doesn't need prayer. It just needs you to use your tongue correctly. Police brutality cannot be tolerated by my administration. And a black man is as important as a white man. I'm buying the coffin for the man who died and I'm giving a scholarship for his children. And you may not even pay the scholarship. Taxpayers' money may do. What will you lose for that than to come out and say what happened happens to all other races and it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's, some things are at a talking realm. God answered your prayer but you are still talking against the answer. Some things are at a talking realm. Some divorces are just because someone can't say I'm sorry. Because the bigger one among the two of you is the one who apologizes first. And the smaller one is the one who wins every argument. And the stronger one is the one who is first to forgive. And the strongest is one who forgives and forget. So it's not all things that are in the realm of prayer. And Arabok is now releasing things that are not in the realm of prayer. But you, you're calling someone by a, a pin code that activates a certain atmosphere. Because no one knows what Mofu was doing 900 years ago. But Mith says when Mofu was in Tanzania, he was a very smart guy who treated his wife nice so that she doesn't suspect that he's fooling around. And if you keep calling people morph, are you not programming them to behave so? If you call someone Chihera, are you not programming her to be a spirit of anti-marriage? So, some things are not in the realm of prayer. They are not in the realm of prayer. If my people are called by my name, shall live their evil ways, humble themselves and pray, I, God, will hear them from heaven and will heal their land. Could it be that before we start to pray, thunderous prayers for the nation, lightning bolt prayers for the nation, thunder and acid prayers for the nation, we who are praying are the first who are supposed to do the right thing by humbling ourselves and repenting. Because if a society has a problem of selfishness, we first have to diagnose if there's no selfishness in the church. Because if the church is selfish and the, the prayer leader is selfish and the church head is selfish and we're asking God to deal with the spirit of selfishness because we see it in others more than we see it in ourselves. Could it be that God is hearing from heaven and is coming down, but someone is not humble and turning away from his evil sins? Could it be because women are raped, misused and abused in the business circle, in the political circle, but also in church circles? But is the church who is supposed to pray for the emancipation in other circles? when sometimes the disease starts with us. So God says, when you pray, first deal with you. So the secret of prayer is not in the verbose. The secret of prayer is not in the spiritual language. The spirit of prayer is not in that says the Lord or the projection of your voice or how high is the prayer mountain or how holy it is because another holy man prayed in it. The secret of prayer starts with dealing with you. So you can sleep in a mountain every Friday and you can fast until we can count all your bones. 
And if you are a man, we can actually point at the missing rib. And yet God always emphasized before you pray, deal with you. Because we always think it's the juju uncle causing problems. We always think it's the juju auntie causing problems. But it's not more about them than about us. So if prayer does not change you first, it's not, it's not prayer. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26 from verse 39, Jesus went to the garden of Gethsemane and told his disciples, wait here. He went a stone throw away and he prayed three times. First he says, Father, all things are possible with you. I wish you could remove some scriptures from the Bible. This cup must pass away, Father. Then he says, but nevertheless, your will, not mine. Prayer changed him. So I don't want to go through this. This cup is too heavy. And the father didn't respond. But when he said, your will, not mine, then prayer ended. Because his prayer changed him. It didn't change God. But we, we are praying that God may change his mind. Yet God wants us to change first. Prayer is to deal with us because he says three times that when you pray, say like this, but if you don't forgive your enemies, your father will not hear you. If you don't like me, if you hurt me, please text me a message. I'll send you man after service. Because prayer has to deal with you first. And if prayer deals with you, then listen, ladies and gentlemen. When Job was going through a mess, which he wasn't supposed to go through, because there was a conversation in heaven and God said, I trust Job. Please go try him. But sister, don't do that to your boyfriend. You go. So he says, I trust this man, devil, go and see. You won't change. So it wasn't Job's fault. It was a heavenly argument. But when God comes, he begins to rebuke Job in chapter 38 and says, hear you. And he began to talk as if Job was the problem. And for sure he was the problem. Prayer is to deal with you first before it deals with somebody. So this book is written and this book is publicized. And agents of Satan read the book. And they go to the secret outer and say, the bearer of the news should suffer. But I have bad news. For, for Sekuru, for Gombre, for Mondoro, for Shikiro. We was texting those threatening messages after my interview at ZBC on Africa religion, a blessing on curse, and threatening and threatening and talking about Mashavi and this. I've got bad news today. I've got bad. You know, declarations like this are very dangerous, eh? They are very dangerous. But... In Shona, we say, Mutuma Nambonje. Don't harm the messenger. I'm a messenger today to tell every Shikiro, every Muroi, every Stokoloshi, every Chidoma, from Arare to Bulueyo, from Zambezi to Limpopo, that, that I'm not going to fight you because this is not my battle. I want to tell Zimbabwe that I'm praying for my nation. I want to tell a scripture of 1 Timothy chapter 2 from verse 1. I'm praying for my nation. I'm fasting for my nation. And Second Chronicles says, uh, uh, God will heal our land. I'm praying. I'm praying based on prophecy. Cindy Jacob prophesied and other prophets. I'm praying because the Bible says I should do that. And now you want to target me because I'm exposing the wicked scheme of Satan. And I have a word for you, devil, that the Lord told me two days ago to come and tell Zimbabwe that I'm not going to fight this battle because it's not mine God told me to mind my own business so I want to tell you Gombe Shikiro I want to tell you that the Lord said mind your own business and I'm just moving in obedience I'm minding my own business please go and tell your mother-in-law please go and tell your stepfather that God said mind your own business and and your issue is no longer my business please go tell Pharaoh that Tell Pharaoh that this, this war is not going to be fought by Israel. Israel is no part in what I'm about to do to Pharaoh. 
It's not Israel's battle. I'm just honoring my promise to my friend Abraham. I am your friend. And I have a covenant with God. And two days ago he came and told me to tell you. That you, the prophet prayed it didn't change. The apostle prayed it didn't change. You sowed seed, it didn't change. You tithed, it didn't change. Three days, three nights, it didn't change. Forty days, it didn't change. But he said, you tried all you could and it failed because you are fighting in a wrong realm. You are fighting in a wrong dimension. Because the dimension for any fight that's bigger than you is that the, the, the battle is not yours. The, this thing is from Malawi. And it started before you were born. This thing is from Tanzania. It started before you were born. This thing is all the way from Adam. It started before there was any prediction you could exist. And the battle is not yours. It's not yours. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than you. Your mom divorced twice. Your grandmother divorced three times. Your great-grandmother divorced four times. Your great-great-great-grandmother was never married at all. And you are now on a roller coaster. I have a word for you. It's older than you. It's bigger than you. You didn't start it and you won't finish it because the battle is not yours and you are not going to fight this one. You may sit down for a while as I told you that the Holy Spirit is hijacking my message. Because it's just whispered to me that there are some people he loved a little bit more than others. And you are one of them. You are one of them. The love of God is just so much on you. To such an extent that for you God is still righteous and just but he's not fair. Because favor is very unfair. And you are favored. You are the apple of his eye. You are the apple of his eye. Job is the richest man in the land of Lars. He has 10 nice kids, 3 daughters, 7 sons. So much wealth. The man is controlling the stock market of the Middle East. Because the Bible says he was the richest man in the East. He's controlling the transport industry. 3,000 camels. 500 she donkeys. He's controlling the beef industry. He has so many cattle. Then he's controlling the wool industry. He has thousands of sheep and is controlling the grain industry. He has fields and fields and grain and has a big workforce. The man's life is flying and he fears God. He has choose evil. And the biggest thing about Job's description in chapter 1 is not about his wealth. The biggest thing in Job chapter number 1 is that the Bible describes his, his wealth and Satan says, hush. God. Does Job worship you for nothing? If I take what you gave him, you curse you to your face. Then God says, go do it. And Satan says, dead, I've got, uh, uh, not, not dead, that's a relational. Creator Elohim Adonai says, Adonai, I've got an objection to this. Because whenever I'm trying to touch Job, someone is giving me a fivefold ministry. Satan said there's a hedge of protection around Job. I can't touch him. The same protection that Satan complained over Job is upon you. Right now, there are 10,000 angels that are releasing a wall of fire upon each and every one of you. The altar is spoken. The, the oracle has spoken. The priest of the Lord has spoken. There is a wall of fire. There is a wall of fire. Whenever Satan, Azazel, Jezebel, would try to lay a finger on you, there is a wall of fire around you. There's a wall of fire. So Satan complained, and that was the biggest highlight that I had missed in a very long time. And the second thing I had missed in a very long time was that The Bible described everything that Job had, seven nice sons, three nice daughters, and described how they would go for a party, and sometimes they would miss it in the party, they would go astray in the party, and the father would 
give sacrifices for each and every one of his children. At least they cursed God in the sacrifice. Then the Bible described about the wealth of Job, then described about the heavenly conversation. But that chapter says nothing about his wife. Both God and the devil did not describe anything about his wife. They spoke about the kids. They spoke about the wealth. They spoke about the character. But they said nothing about his wife. And when Satan was coming to attack, he destroyed the, the flock. He destroyed the cattle. He destroyed the donkeys. He destroyed the camels. He destroyed the grain. But he didn't touch Job's wife. Then he, in chapter 2, he requested for Job's health, and he was given Job's wealth. Still, Satan did nothing about his wife. And the question is, what makes her so special? Either God, neither God nor the devil are talking about here. Please, this is not chauvinism. It's just the Bible. Because the Bible says, then Job's wife came and said, curse God and die. So Satan is not stupid enough to attack some people because there are his ground troops there are his ground troops could it be that you are praying for someone who should be out of your life you know it it buffets my mind why job would never lay sacrifices for both his children and his wife. I wonder. I wonder. Then the third thing that's always missed in this passage is that in spite of Job's problems and predicament, when Satan came, Satan didn't start the conversation over Job. God said, where are you coming from, Satan? He said, I was north, east, west, south around the world. I was in Zimbabwe. Then I went to South Africa. I went to Nigeria. And USA is getting exciting. But these days I'm staying in Wuhan, China. <laughs> and um, God said, did you see my servant job? Do you know what it meant? Job was in God's mind. I thought ladies would celebrate. Because if somebody will say good morning. If somebody will say good evening. If your first message is coming from somebody's joke that is sent to you. Would it not mean you are in his mind? But please be careful. You are just in his mind. Let it end there. So, I thought ladies would celebrate this. And I know why you're not celebrating. Because the guy seated next to you is not doing it. So, God say, God reveals that Job was in his mind. So, before your warfare starts, you should know that you are going through stuff because you're in God's mind. And Satan doesn't attack things that are valueless. And because there is so much favor on your life, a messenger of Satan was sent to buffet you day and night. Yet I have a prophecy that is sweeter than 700 sermons. And the prophecy is, this is not your battle, mind your own business. So please, pastor, stop fasting. Tonight, I give you a special privilege for only tonight to eat junk. Buy streetwise two hot wings and fried chips and a colonel beggar on top. And then a shawarma. Eat junk today. Sister, eat junk today. You jog. You jog those extra calories tomorrow morning. It junk tonight. Why? Because this is none of your business. Satan should have left the battle at your level. He should have continued at the level at which he was fighting and attacking you for the past 20 years. But because he stepped up the battle, he has just fallen in trouble. 
I, I feel the spirit of the preacher sitting upon me. I feel that anointing which was on Peter in Acts 2, which was on Paul when he preached in prison. I feel that spirit upon me. I feel Matthew 5, 6, and 7 when Jesus was preaching on the mount on the hill. I, I feel Matthew 13 on me when seven parables were given. I feel, I feel the preacher in me. And let me preach to somebody right now. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego has just witnessed their prayer partner being promoted in chapter 2. They fasted together. They all had an all-night prayer together. And it's only Daniel who got the pro promotion. And the three are left in the doldrums. Doesn't it hurt you that you were fasting with him, praying with him, but now he's parking and you, you're still in Futron? Doesn't it bother you that you are fasting together, praying, decreeing, and declaring, but this is the tenth time you are the best girl? And she is the bride. Doesn't it bother you that you have been a flower girl all your child life and the best girl all your adult life and your wheels are not moving? So these boys were praying with Daniel and Daniel is now a statesman and they're still in the terraces. Then in chapter 3, God reveals something that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego could add ignored that Daniel got a promotion first but it's on higher per chest because you pay for it later. A den of lions is waiting for him. But as for you, it's not higher per chest. It's cash on delivery. It's a C or D. It's not, it's, 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 it's not a, 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 a pay letter. It's a, it's a cash on delivery. It's a C or D. I deliver, you pay. So because they are not going to pay the price letter like me. They are not going to pay the price letter like you. You and I, what I just mean is we are not going to pay the price letter we are paying now. So Shadrach, Mishak and Abednego are in our realm. People who pay first before they get it. Shadrach, Mishak and Abednego are in the African culture realm. You, you give me 10,000, I give you my daughter. She won't just go. And every parent with a daughter is supposed to smile on this. So, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's time for promotion has come. And I'm sure when Daniel texted the message and said, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, congratulations, I had a vision from God. You're about to be mad chancellors. You're about to join me and become statesmen. You are joining me in the cabinet of Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sure the boys threw a party and celebrated. But little did they know that there is always a way to glory. And there's no easy way to glory. Econet, five years of legal battle, there's no easy way to glory. There's no easy way to glory. There's no easy way to independence. There's no easy way to civilization. There's no easy way to freedom. There's no easy way to glory. Sometimes it takes vomiting. Sometimes it takes screaming and kicking for it to come out because there's no easy way to glory. And the three are about to be promoted, but how is the promotion coming? The king makes an image of gold. And he said, every nation under the sun, because he was the emperor, should bow down to this image. But the target were only the three boys. 24 carat gold made into a six feet by six feet by six feet gold. You know, this gold was more expensive than, than who is that footballer who was sold for 200 million, that boy from, from Brazil. It was more expensive than him. And all that money was for the promotion of Shadrach, Michigan, and Abednego. A furnace was set up to melt the gold for only three boys. Everyone was to bow down. All Israel were tempted because of only these three boys. And the three boys, they were defiant. They said, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not bound down to this image. We are not. And I want to tell somebody, don't bow down, don't give up. 
because you won before it started. So he said, we are, we, are, we are not careful to answer you, king. We are not careful because our God is able to deliver us from your hand. We have faith. But if he doesn't, I want you to know we'll still win. If he delivers us, we win. But if he doesn't, we still win because we can be delivered from the fire or we can be delivered in the fire. So either you are going to be delivered from the divorce or you'll be delivered in the divorce. You're going to be delivered from the setback or you'll be delivered in the setback. And little faith says you deliver me, but great faith says even if he doesn't, I'll be delivered in the fire. So the Bible says they were Nebuchadnezzar was so angry and this is where he made the mistake. He said, lit the furnace seven times water. Lit the furnace seven times water. Now, why not twice? Because this furnace has just melted gold and it takes 700 degrees Celsius to cremate a human body. And it takes much more to melt gold. So if it melted gold, why should it be 10, 7 times water? Because Satan is wise in his foolishness. And sometimes when God wants to promote your job, he will cause Satan to set stage for the promotion. Because Job is living in principle. He is eschewing evil, he fears God. And my doctrine says if I am in principle, God is obliged to set a ring fence of protection around me. The doctrine says if you are in principle, then God should bless you and God should protect you. But what happens when you are in principle and Satan still finds his way anyway? You didn't beat her up. You didn't cheat on her. You didn't harass her. You took good care of her. But still, she walked. What happens when I'm in principle and I'm on the top of the retrenchment list? I'm loyal. I'm, I'm, I'm so subordinate. I'm competent. I work so hard. My deliverables, I cut above the rest. My SWOT analysis is excellent. But why am I on top of the hit list? Have you ever asked yourself a question? Why you are the best murora in the village? You are the one who lit up the fire at the funeral. You are the one who carry out the water for the, for the gravesite at the funeral. You do all the murora stuff. But they, they always want to slander and talk bad about you. Now, if I'm in principle, God is supposed to protect me. That's basic knowledge. But what if I'm in principle, pastor, and still I find the ring fence breached and the enemy is attacking me? And Africa, because Africa is a judgmental society, whenever bad things happen to someone, we always want to assume he did something bad. So in the typical African church, the sister is going through stuff is probably doing something we didn't see behind the scenes. Amen. So we believe that you are whipped because you did something wrong. But what about Job who was in principle and still wrong things happened? How do you explain that? Now, the Lord answered me and said, when you are in principle and still bad stuff happens to you, when you are the son of God, you are the immaculate white of the milk. Of God, the infallible, the indefatigable, in whom there's no shadow of turning. You are the very son of God, but still you are hanging on a cross naked. What has happened for a man in principle to go through stuff? I know 50 church folk who I know should at least be in twice or three times the fire I'm in. But it seems like they're getting blessed and I'm getting messed up. And that's when many people give up on God. Because the question is, I didn't do something wrong. And I've done everything right. But why am I being whipped? But I have an answer for you. Job, if you are in principle and still Satan finds way to destroy you. 
it's a setup for a promotion. So whenever you are doing something right, whenever you sowed the seed, but after sowing the seed, there was an attack. After the three days of fasting, there was an attack. After, after, after feeding the orphan, there was an attack. It means, it means, it means God is setting me up. It's a setup. It's a setup. Now, Satan attacks us in three ways. Satan has three arms to steal, kill, and destroy. And the arms are the flesh, the world, and him. Because Satan can't access your spirit. Your spirit is the throne room of God. Your heart is Jesus' throne. But the Bible says he's the God of this world. The Bible says rulers of wicked, of, of darkness, rulers of darkness, then it says also rulers of those that are walking in darkness. I'm losing many of you. Is this too deep for you? Listen now. The Bible says then that Satan is in the world. Then in John 17, Jesus said, Father, I'm praying not only for my disciples, but for all those who are to come. I'm also praying for ABJ. I'm not praying that you remove them from the earth, from the world. I'm praying that you protect them in the world. They are not of the world, but they are in the world. So he says, because Goshen is in Egypt, but it's not really in Egypt because the plagues that are, the plagues that are hitting Pharaoh are not hitting Goshen. Because they are in Egypt, but they are not Egyptians. They are in the world, but they are not of the world. Now, he works by creating situations in your world. And Satan is only as big as the situation he set up in the world. Let me explain and expound on this. Satan, you are in Johannesburg and you are scared for your life right now. Because Satan is only as big as xenophobia. We know how big Satan is. He's as big as a headache. We know how big Satan is. He's as big as a tire puncher. We know how big Satan is. He's as big as Sadza with boiled cabbages. That's all he can do. That's all he can do. What you have been going through is the full length and breadth of how big Satan is. So why could we be, should we be scared of him when he's only as big as a bacteria and a virus, which I can block with a mask? So Satan is only as big as the situation, and your situation is created by your world. And you are connected to your world by your flesh, through your senses. And for Satan to quench your spirit, he should make the situation speak to your flesh and make the flesh speak to your spirit. But for God to reverse the order, he doesn't reverse the order by changing the situation first. Because God is not in the world. The Bible says in 1 John 2, from verse 15 to 17, God's love is not in the world. But he so loved the world. So he doesn't change the situation. He doesn't go to Delta to change your situation. He's not going to the bank to change your situation. What he does is his domain is the spirit. So when you pray to God that your situation may change, he doesn't change the situation to change your faith. He gives you a word in your spirit. And the word he gives you in your spirit, if it grows to faith, that word will change your world. So he breaches God, Job's protection circle and he begins to temper with Job's world. And Job's strength then was to hold on to God's faith and his, his confession rather than paying attention to what Satan was doing. So this comes to my sermon headline today because I said fireplace. What is fireplace? Fireplace means focal point. So your battle is not about money. It's not about shelter. Your battle is not about the landlord. Your battle is not about your car. Your battle is not about your age working against you. Your battle is a focus battle. God wants you to see what your focus really is. Because in the battle, 
the highlight of the battle is not the doctor's diagnosis. The highlight of the battle are not the people leaving you or somebody slandering you. The highlight of the battle is where is your focus? Are you focusing on the nightmare or you are focusing on God you don't see? So my battle is not mine. It belongs to God. But for God to be activated in that battle, which is his battle anyway, he is activated by focus. He wants to see if you can elevate Jesus above your situation. And faith is elevating Jesus above your situation. Jesus is above your daughter's asthma. He is above your son's ulcers. He is above the headache. Jesus is above the spooky wife. He is above the haughty, troublesome, burdensome husband. Jesus is above that HR executive picking up on you. Jesus is above your mother-in-law or your demon-in-law. Jesus is above your father-in-law or your demon-in-law. Jesus is above the deacon gossiping or the demon gossiping. Jesus is above your situation. So if you focus on your situation, it's not going to change his level to come down to your focus. But if you focus on him, who is bigger than your big problem, your big problem will be changed because you send a BJ on a day like this to give you a word in your spirit for your situation. He specializes only in situations that are bigger than people. Because if it's within your solution, he's not going to get some praise. But for him to get perfect praise, all strategies has to be filtered. If I tried northeast, west, south, and all has failed, the only place I have to cast my eyes on is on God. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are now going into the fire believing. Don't lose faith if you go into the fire believing. Keep on believing. Even when the fire is seven times hotter than it is today. Keep on believing. Keep on believing. Even if the doctor says you have seven days to go. Keep on believing. When the car is somersaulting and is in mid-air. And you are falling into the bridge. Don't shout my way. Shout Jesus. 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 Because he will send his angels. They will lay hands on you. Until your feet dash against the stone. It's a focus battle. He doesn't want you to focus on the millimeter. He doesn't want you to focus on the rice. Or on the porridge doesn't want you to focus on the birth certificate or the death certificate. He wants you to focus on him. So you praise God two way. You praise God when things are well and you praise God when things are rough. And the better praise is when things are twisted. So now the three boys has a fire turned seven times water. Can I talk about seven for a few minutes? I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in my mouth right now. So, let me talk about seven. Let me talk about seven. Jesus is in a holy week. Holy week is the week he died. First, in the first day, he had, he had a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. People are throwing palm leaves. People are throwing clothes. So that his new coat can walk on. They are not even throwing palm leaves for Jesus to walk on. But for something that Jesus is riding to walk on. Because if Jesus is on you. You walk in the heavenly tarmac. You walk on palm trees. You walk. You know. The praise that was going on Jesus. Was being spent by the donkey. Because it's the donkey that walked on comfort. Because it was Jesus giving Jesus comfort. And after entering, he, the next thing he overturned the tables of the money changers and said, my father's house shall be a house of prayer. After he restored prayer, he curses the fig tree because it's a leafy but it's not giving him figs. After cursing the fig tree, a woman breaks in and get crushes the party and the woman cries on his feet 
then she used her hair to dry the feet and perfumed the feet. And Judas is offended because he wanted the perfume sold so that he's still part of it. And because Judas is offended, he tries to object and Jesus showed him that he knew that he was a thief. Then after that, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And he says, the one who is dipping the morsel with me in the same dish will betray me. Can I explain about that 30 seconds? Because in the Jewish culture, when people are about to eat, they were arranged from the greatest to the least. The greatest being the father of the house or the firstborn in the house, the least being the lastborn. Then the eldest in the family is the one who does the bon appetit. Number one, the eldest blesses the bread and breaks the bread. Then dips the first bread in the morsel and everybody starts eating. It's just Jewish culture. So Jesus says, somebody in this church who does not respect me enough to consider me as the most senior authority and is impatient to have me dip my morsel in the, in the soup first. Somebody who doesn't, somebody who think because we put one leg at a time in the trousers, we are the same, is going to betray me. And the Bible says, he looked at Judas and said, whatever I want to do, it, do it quickly. And Satan immediately entered Judas. And after that, Jesus began to wash people's hands and feet. And he gave them holy communion and says, keep on doing this. And he took Peter, John, and James to Gethsemane, the place of pressing. And he prayed three times. And Judas came and kissed him and betrayed him with a kiss. Then he's brought before Caiaphas, the high priest. Then before Pontius Pilate, before he rode and back to Pontius Pilate. Then he's flogged, he's beaten, and he's taken to the cross. And when he was on the cross... It was a few hours before Sabbath because Sabbath was starting at 5 p.m. And he was in the cross in the morning. And for three hours there was darkness until the midday. And after that he gave up his ghost and died. You know the whole story, right? Now listen to me from back to front. Jesus dies and the Jewish custom is not done on him. Because... According to Jewish burial rites, rites to burial, Jewish burial rites, when somebody dies, they do, do, they do a ritual called embalming for three days. They embalm for three days. Then bury the person on the fourth day. That's why when Lazarus died, Jesus went on the fourth day. Because if he had gone there, on the first, second, or third day, he was going to find the body outside the tomb. So he waited for the embalming rites to be initiated and came on the day the man was now in the tomb, stink, stinking. Are you with me? So according to Lord Jesus, was supposed to be embalmed three days, then buried on the fourth. And because First Peter chapter 2 says he was going to first Tartarus, which is only mentioned by Peter, where those demons in uh, Genesis 6 are, are abounding. And to preach also to people who perish in the time of Noah, then go through Hades and hell and take the keys of death and hell and resurrect on the third day. So it means if he was going to be buried on the fourth day and resurrect on the third day, after three days of embalmment, it was going to take Jesus seven days in the process of death and resurrection. But death and resurrection was not supposed to be in the seventh realm because the seventh realm is the realm of completeness yes. so jesus is not completed in death he's completed in resurrection and ascension so because completion is to be finished in heaven when he pours out his blood on the holy place according to hebrews that he went to heaven and entered into the holy place of heaven and poured his blood which is so fresh up to this day demons can confess it because when you shout the blood of jesus they know what you're talking about so the days were reduced to three because God is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is triune and three is the number of God. So Jesus was dying in the God realm so that he could be resurrected. Because the resurrector was God, the Holy Spirit. He raised Jesus from the dead. And if the Holy Spirit is going to raise me from the dead, 
He has to rouse me on the third day because the first day is the Father, the second day is the Word, the last day is the Spirit. It has to be three, not seven, because the story is not over until the Holy Ghost says it's over. So they turned the finest seven times water. That was a big mistake because they took it to God's realm. And when they took it to God's realm, they threw them into the fire and the people threw them into the fire. They died. But when Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fire, he saw four men. And when the f he saw four men, but three came out. He said, did I not cast, out three, cast three men into the furnace? And this, he, the answer was yes. He said, why, why is there a fourth man who looks like the son of God? But when they came out, there were only three men. So when they turned the fire seven times water, what happened is they took the fire to God's realm. When they took it to God's signature, God says, this Nebuchadnezzar is, is calling me because he took the battle to my level. So when he felt Nebuchadnezzar had taken the battle from the human level to his level, he left heaven and entered into the furnace. Now watch this. When Jesus came down, he didn't wait for the three boys to be thrown in the fire so that he shows up. And he didn't wait for the three boys to come out of the fire so that he goes back to heaven but what he did when this furnace called him he entered into the furnace and waited for the boys because if he had delayed three seconds the boys were going to be cremated if he had delayed one second the boys were going to be turned to ashes so he had to be in the furnace before the boys and now before your enemies are you Jesus was already in the situation because the situation is at his realm how can I fight cancer how can I fight a twenty thousand dollar situation when my salary is two hundred dollars how can I pay a four thousand dollar lobola when my salary is ten thousand bond notes definitely this fight is not my fight but Jesus is already in the fight before the star fight started so I want to read something with you before I go on to my conclusion we are still on Exodus chapter number 23 and we were on verse 27 but we want to go on verse 28 and see something and I will send hornets before you we shall drive out the Hevites the Canaanites, the Hittite, from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land becomes desolate. Get this closely, okay? And the beast of the field multiply against you. He's saying, I'm not going to deal with your enemies in one year. There's a reason he didn't deal with them in 2000, or in 2005, or in 2007, or in 1999, or in 1996. Or in 2019 because he said if I deal with them in one year beasts will multiply so I want to use your enemies and I'll keep them in your backyard because I have a contract for them so don't worry about these little devils don't worry about these little demons they are on contract daddy has them on contract then he says by little and little, I'll drive them out from before you until you be increased and inherit the land. So what God is just saying here is saying, you are still spiritually mature for me to remove all of them at once. So I'm solving your situation, but little by little until you are increased, meaning until you mature in the Lord. So your enemy is just taking you job to a place of maturity where you can be able to withstand a double dimension of your blessing because it is illegal to read job chapter 1 and not read chapter 42 because job chapter 1 from verse 6 starts the messing up of job but chapter 42 from verse 10 says and God remembered job and he made him double what he was before so he said I'm not going to deal with your enemies at once but slowly until you are multiplied. So he has been dealing with barrenness year by year. And the year you're getting the child is not the year where God came. God was dealing with it all along. 
He was just waiting for you, Abraham, to mature and your maturity is 100. He was waiting for you, Moses, to mature and your maturity was 80. Now listen to me carefully. And then he says on verse 31, And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines and from the desert unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them nor with their God. They shall not dwell in your land lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, I will surely be a snare to you. So God has sent hornets. Everyone say hornets. Another version says angels. Now, after he sent these angels and this hornet before them, something is making me stick a bit in the book of Exodus. And right now, I'm looking for chapter 33. And let, let me leave it alone. Because in chapter 33, God is now doing something because all along, Jacob could meet the glory of God. Isaac could meet the glory of God. But to Moses, he's saying the glory is now on you because he came out and his face was shining like God's face. Because to all others, they are meeting my glory, but now my glory is on you. And the second person to have his face carry glory is Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17 when he was transfigured and his face began to shine. And when it happened, Moses again was there because he was handing over a mantle to the Lord which he got from this chapter 33 that a man can carry God on his face. It's a sermon for another day, but coming back to my issue, God says, I'm sending hornets before you. He didn't say behind you. They will do the work before you even enter into the trouble. Then they get into the land and settles and now they have Jerusalem, they have built the temple and life is cool. And Jehoshaphat becomes king and after he becomes king, fights a battle together with Ab. And after that, the Bible says he took the brazen serpent, which people had begun to worship. You remember when God sent snakes to kill people in the wilderness, Moses built a brazen serpent and all who casted their eyes on it lived. Now Israel was now worshipping that brazen serpent and Jehoshaphat destroyed it. And the Bible says he also destroyed altars in high places. Altars in high places were places of idolatry. And he killed people who were practicing witchcraft and sorcery. And after he killed them, the Bible says he restored worship to God. And Israel's heart was turned back to God, which means he was a revivalist. He brought revival into the nation. And the man who is bringing revival and restoring holiness and preaching the true word, who is preaching the undiluted word, who is preaching the undiluted Jesus, who is not preaching money cars and keys, but is preaching Jesus and Jesus alone, has a doomsday where he is eating his grapes in the palace and dancers are dancing and life is all cool. And he hears one message that spins his life out of control. Have you ever received one text message that spins your life out of control? Have you ever got one phone call that spins your life out of control? Have you ever had a meeting with your accountant and one report will never wreck you? Have you ever had an internal audit and the audit results they give you, they put you on hypertension? Have you ever woke up married and by the time you go to bed you received one message that has left you alone on the pillow? Have you ever been through a white wedding and one honeymoon becomes a nightmare? 
It's one message that changed the life of Jehoshaphat because the spies came and says, King, behold the Moabites, the Amorites, or Ammonites, and the Mount Seers are gathered in Azazun Tamar in En Gedi. And they are coming as a great multitude and they are coming to exterminate you. Now, they as battles you can ignore. Have you been through marital counseling, premarital counseling? When you go through premarital counseling, the counselors will tell you, say, choose your fights. Don't fight over Colgate. Should you squeeze, uh, 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 should, should, should you, should you squeeze from the top or from the bottom? Don't fight over toilet seats. Choose your battles. It's a sweet counsel. But there are some battles you can't choose. Because they are death or life battles. It's threatening to exterminate you completely. If you ever had one hater who has a vow to make sure he wants nothing but blood. Joshua hears a message and says, King, all you worked for is ending today. These three forces have combined together and they are coming after you. Now, three things are so painful about that. Pay attention. Pay attention. Three things are important about this. Because number one, these enemies were not from far away. The closest of them was 15 miles south of Jerusalem. Number two, these enemies were their relatives. Who is Moab, the firstborn son of Lot? Who is Lot, Abraham's nephew? And what did Abraham do? He prayed so that Lot may be spared from the judgment. Who is Amnon? He's the second son of, no of Lot, which he had with his second daughter. The people who Abraham had interceded for. Then who are the Mount Says? The Mount Says are the Edomites. And who are the Edomites? The Edomites are a product of Ishmael's daughter and Isaac's son, Esau. So, it's our brothers and our sisters because Ishmael was brother to Isaac and Esau was brother to Jacob. And through incest, they produced Edom. Are you listening to me? So these are our relatives, our nephews, and our brothers who have combined forces to destroy us. Do you know that when Satan wants to destroy you, and he destroys you from outside, it doesn't hurt. Real pain comes when you are destroyed by someone or something you love. It won't hurt if it's not a business you contributed your whole life to build. It won't hurt if it's not a church you fasted for, prayed for, and slept on an empty stomach for. It won't hurt if you don't love him. It won't hurt if you don't love him. It has to be somebody who is close to you. And the painful part is, if our father hadn't interceded for them, they wouldn't be here because when Ishmael was chased away through Sarah's instigation, Abraham prayed for Ishmael and says, 12 princes will come out of you and he blessed Ishmael. Daddy, why did you bless somebody who is now coming to wipe us out? The angels are coming to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham is saying, if I find five righteous, will you spare them? And by his intercession, Lot is saved. Abraham, why didn't you pray? Why did you pray for people who are coming to exterminate us. It's so painful. Because when you are truly anointed, you can pray for a devil and it will prosper. So, Lord has prospered because of Abraham and is spared because of Abraham. Have you fasted and prayed for people who later on came and broke your heart? Have you sacrificed your pension on people who no longer pick up your call? Have you ever contributed so much and split your life wide open going out of your way to help people who have made you the chief rhythm 
of their gossip music. And it hurts more so. He is now being attacked. But who are the enemies attacking? The enemies that are my relatives and my friends. Because the most powerful Muroi is the one who shares the same bloodline with you. How painful it is when your pastor fleeces, fleeces your hard-earned money. How painful is it if you are hurt by your own father? How painful it is if it's your own brother? That's what was happening to Israel. And Israel is an emotional pain of betrayal and at the same time a physical fear of being exterminated. And the Bible says Jehoshaphat came out and he looked into the valley and when he saw the numerous number of soldiers, he became afraid and began to shake in fear. Because he is about to be wiped out completely. I'm about to be wiped out. If I can find $2,000 in 48 hours, I'm about to be wiped out. I'm about to be wiped out. If I can find $300, I'm sleeping outside without a home with my children. I'm about to be wiped out. My daughter is so intelligent, but I don't have money to send her to school. I'm about to be wiped out because, because he is the predator and I am the prey. But he has twisted the story and is now vowing to destroy my life. This fight is a death or life fight and this fight is beyond me. And if you are going through something that's beyond you, I have a word for you. Because the prophet came and said, Jehoshaphat, please calm down. For the battle is not yours. The battle belongs to the Lord. The battle is not yours. The battle belongs to God. So, as I conclude and give you grace and speak grace, pardon me, I don't give grace, I speak grace because the giver of grace is Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord, thank you. Yes, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the, the Bible never says Satan is powerful. Did you read the Bible well? It never says it's powerful. It just says it's strategic. Having done all to stand, put on the whole armor of God so that you may put away the wiles of the enemy. What are the wiles of the enemy? They are not powers of the enemy. They are the methods of the enemy, which are methods, strategies, strategia. The Bible says, now the snake was more subtle than all creatures of the field. And the snake said to Eve, Satan is an opportunist. He took opportunity that was presented to him by Eve when Eve was loitering around a tree that God said, don't eat away, don't eat from. If she hadn't loitered around the tree, she was not going to fall. Satan takes advantage of opportunities we give him. Ephesians 4 verse 27, don't give Satan a place. So, how do you give Satan a place and how does Satan use his strategies against you number one by amplifying situations amplifying situations Satan normally wants to work with very little things very little gap gaps you open for him very little loopholes do you know Esau lost his birthright because of a bowl of soup little loopholes do you know how this mighty army ended up coming after Israel because, because Abraham prayed for Lot. But what happened for him to pray for Lot? Lot's headsmen had a misunderstanding with Abraham's headsmen. And it ended Lot in Sodom and he married a Sodomite woman, Midas, and produced two half Sodomite girls and Amnon and Moab were born. Satan uses small situations that are presented to him. But I'm asking God to deal with those weaknesses you think are little. My, I'm praying right now that God deals with that anger. That mood swing. That depression. I'm praying that he deals with that anxiety, that stress, that fear. I'm praying that he deals with that talkative mouth. That doesn't know when to stop speaking. Like Joseph giving Satan all the intel about him. I'm going to be 
the chief in my family and blah 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 and Satan who is not omniscient who doesn't know everything sometimes know from what we tell him so he amplifies situations many of the things people are going through were supposed to be very insignificant issues that could be ignored but they gave Satan a chance but there's a prayer for you today that every door that the enemy has been using against you is closed in the name of Jesus Christ I didn't shout I just spoke because when the door was open there was no shouting and and number two the devil used a mystery called the mystery of the watchers the watchers are those who spy on you and gives him information the watchers look at this the bible says the magi came to Herod and said we saw this tower of jesus in the east and we've been following it and they say it took two years for them to find where the baby was in jerusalem that's why Herod killed all babies two years and below so your star starts shining before you are even called before you were formed in your mother's womb, Jeremiah, I ordained you a prophet. So Satan knows something big is coming to this family because he saw your star before you were even born. That's why he started fighting you before you even knew how to come to church. Why would Satan fight me so much like this when I have so little? It's because you are a baby today, but he's seeing a king on the throne. He saw your star in the heaven. So Satan is a, is a good is a good investigator of the stars of zodiac. He can read people's stars. But I love God because the Bible says when the Magi came to Herod's palace, the star disappeared. The devil's watchers are not going to see your next step. Because the Bible says in Second Chronicles, he says, and after Jehoshaphat's prayer, and as they worshipped, God set ambushes in the camp's enemy. Today, prophet, the Lord is setting ambushes, traps in the enemy's camp. I saw it, I saw it happening in Karoi in Chitomborwis, I saw it happening in Dande, I saw it happening in Mtirikwi, I saw it happening in Murewa and Chitumwisa it's happening, it's happening it's happening, it's happening oh my god it's happening, I saw it in London, I saw it in Australia and I can see it right now because God is setting ambushes in the enemy's camp thank you Jesus thank you Jesus you won't be able to read your star you won't you know, he wrote yet magicians, yet 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 soothsayers, yet sorcerers. You could have asked them through divination, may you please locate where the baby is being born. But this time God has casted a blind eye on them. They are blind. They are shakara. They are, their spiritual eyes can't see your next level. The devil has been cast into total blindness. You won't see your next step. There is a wall of protection around you and there's an ambush in the camps, camp of the enemy. And the devil doesn't only amplify situations he doesn't turn a headache into a nervous breakdown he doesn't turn a stomach ache into hernia that's not the only way he works Satan also work in the mystery of witchcraft let me take off my glasses and see you with my bare eye I said Satan works in the mystery of witchcraft and when I say witchcraft I'm not only talking of mutin and concoction rebellion is witchcraft do you have a daughter who is jumping out from the toilet window at night to come back 4 a.m. dead drunk? You can beat her, she won't change. You can cancel her, she won't change. It's called stubbornness. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel that stubbornness and rebellion is equal to witchcraft. To witchcraft, rebellion, stubbornness, rebellion, resisting authority, rebellion resisting submission rebellion satan is a rebel he's the chief of all rebels he rebelled in heaven he rebelled and whenever there's rebellion there's witchcraft 
whenever there's rebellion rebellion there is witchcraft but i want to tell you okay let me pause a bit listen witchcraft comes from two words witch and craft which means to divert or to pervert from the original purpose you foolish galatians who has bewitched you having started in the spirit you are now in the flesh to bewitch someone is to program someone against that person's destiny that's witchcraft so a witch needs watchers to see your star first and report to them that your your sister's daughter is the blessed one your 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 brother's son is the one carrying the blessing for the family is the rich guy in town so witchcraft can see the star and what it does it perverts now how does it pervert through its craftiness what is craft science or art so witchcraft is to divert someone's purpose through an art or a science called a craft so the craft the craft divergences so what you're fighting is not what you're supposed to be fighting it's just a divergence but god today multiply the witches of my witch so that he be preoccupied in fighting his battles not me tonight god has set an ambush moab is going to kill amnon and the two are blood brothers and moab and amnon before they kill each other they are going to kill edom the mount seers their cousins and after killing their cousins they are going to kill each other and when i get into the camp the word of god is going to be fulfilled that this is not my fight because i praised and he fought your job in this crisis is to praise while he still fights and you have to praise him through sickness you have to praise him through financial challenge you have to praise him through divorce and separation you have to praise him through gossip and slander you have to praise him through fear and terror you have to praise him through nightmares you have to praise him through night attack and heart attacks you have to praise him through children's insolence you have to praise him you have to praise him through stubborn situations you have to praise him through nerve-wracking situations you have to praise him praise him through the argument praise him through the the situation beyond control praise him i praise you god tonight for my battles i praise you for my afflictions for many are the afflictions of the righteous but god you deliver him out of them all but before you deliver him there are plenty afflictions i i praise you for my plenty afflictions i praise you take all the glory take all the honor through my joy inside hatred being hated being talked on be walked on being lied on father i still thank you and i call you adonai i praise you father for zimbabwe i praise you for southern africa i praise you through last year's drought i praise you through this pandemic i praise you i praise you even though lord i was supposed to build for 12 months and now i'm halfway in 12 months i praise you i praise you lord i praise you i praise you lord i praise you 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 lord i praise you i praise you for the house i lost i praise you for the car i lost i praise you for the people walked out on me i praise you 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 praise him for that man who abused you praise him for that man who paid the judge and stole your estate praise him for that woman who broke your heart praise him praise him praise him for that pastor who cursed you praise him 
for that Muroi. Praise him. Praise him. She, she thought she was powerful. But I'm still alive. He thought he had all the power. But I'm still in health. They thought they were in control. But I still have money in my pocket. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. They were after your children, but your children are still going to school. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him for everything that he took away from you. Praise him. Though he slay me, yet I will praise him. Though he slay me, yet I will praise him. Take all the glory, Father, and honor. I bless you, Lord Jesus. I bless you. I bless you. I bless you. I bless you. Take all the glory. Take all the glory for your faithfulness, your power, and your love. Take all the glory. Hands up. Hearts open. Wide as the sky. We lift you high. Lisa, come here with your team. I know time is gone, but I want you to praise him. For that muti you stepped on. And your leg is still going under problem after problem. I want you to praise him for that concoction that blew on you and said you're not going to hold the child. Praise him. Because they are a setup for your promotion. It's not by accident that you're going through stuff. God didn't take a leaf and left you desolate going through stuff. He didn't take an off day. He didn't forget you from the register. He never sleeps nor slumber. The devil even grabbed the driving wheel. No, it's a lie. God is inside your situation. Before it started, he was waiting for you in the fire. I want to tell you something. That one January knew you were going to go through this. Before the situation started, he knew. God doesn't read headlines. He makes headlines. He has no news day. He is the news. God knew how you were going to lose your house. How you were going to fail to pay the loan. And he didn't warn you when you took the loan. He didn't. He didn't. You were warning others. He was sending you to warn others, but he never sent anyone to warn you. Because he was setting you up for a promotion. It's not your fault, Job. You are too blessed. God is trusting you with a battle bigger than you. He has trusted me. He has trusted me with a den of lions. He has trusted me with a furnace. Because he knows a BJ who never say, God, I'm cursing you to die. I can't take this no more. So he, he trusted me with the horrendous. He trusted me with the unbearable. He trusted me with the heartbreak disappointment. He trusted me with prayers going unanswered. He trusted me. He trusted me. He trusted me. He trusted me for being single at almost four decades. He trusted me. He trusted me for losing in faith. Believing yet losing, he trusted me. He has trusted me with this fight. He has trusted me with this battle. And he's trusted you. He has trusted you. He trusted you enough for you to discover that text message in his phone. He trusted you. He trusted you. He trusted you. Through it all, he trusted you. And I'm not going to respond with bitterness, but I'm going to respond with praise. And I'm going to be playing praise music in my car. And I'm going to say, through my situation, I'm going to say, through my trouble and trials, I'm going to say through my cross on my nails I'm going to lift up my eyes like I'm lifting them up right now Lord and I'll tell you Father all the days of my life right here in Zimbabwe Arare, my eyes wide open to you thank you Jesus 
God, I finished preaching, but thank you. You know what God has just whispered to me right now? He's saying Elijah was a man like us, James 5 17. But he prayed and there was no rain. He prayed again and there was rain. Then the Bible says, the Bible says, Peter, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Because he's saying the heaven is word activated. Heaven is word activated. So what you say on earth activates what's in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is word activated. And he told me that Oh, Santa. You know what God is telling me right now? He's saying, Java, your heaven has been opened. You are leaving this church and I open heaven. Oh, Shaka. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha. Ha ya ya. Ha ya ya. Ha ya ya. Oh, ha ya ya. Ho ho. Ha ya. Ha ya ya. Alone take rest and try. Lero thrustan stek laribon stekli shalai letros ten siva boses kishin alais safonia alarositre alos hilara thrusten tali liprosen tili tali laons tekla citrosten vi shali lopsinti tahi le hase kolai monstikaid plastero thristen sha Faliest on tracks on deep on tie. High bone test it on truck like thrist and fire. Satrosin high centri. Paliest on fee. Shuole sati. Satente. Satente. Satente kai. Masoteticla. Saminto tiskin. Liposit and pura. Pura sante ek. Lero oats. Shikloresit. Mahasteti. Parasot. Liprosai. La bonste, Shabina, Leighton Car, Tristan Fee, Satan Cola, Easton T, Tradiga, Ashok, Nikasi, Hashaik, Habonte, Sadiga, Haconde, Sadiga, Libonde, Sadiga, Hakuzimaya, 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 Tiko Mo, Tai, Tai, no, 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 Sate, Lakepo, Alos and Krikonzi, Apache and Tai, Husinte Kalibasta, Kalima is to Tia Post. Fino se kashin, fino she kasin, fino she kasin. Hello, why? Tell Alisa Paripo, die. I closed the door in Noah's Ark. He didn't close it. I closed it. They cried and cried. They cried. Even them, the relatives, and say, remember me. Remember me, Noah. I'm crying out here. I'm drowning. I'm drowning. I'm your clansman. And Noah couldn't open it for his loved ones because I closed it. When I closed, no one opened. And they tried to open them, those giants. They tried to open that door, those giants, but they couldn't open it. The wild beast, they tried to knock it down. They couldn't open it because what I closed, no one opens. And I'm opening your heaven. And I'm opening your heaven. And my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is the neutralizer. And it will neutralize because you are now under open heaven. Heaven is no longer brass to you for it is wide open. And as I've opened the heaven, my angels ascend, my angels descend. And my eyes are on you for you are in the palm of my hand. Even the apple of my eye. And Zimbabwe, you are not forgotten for you are my people. For I have not looked at you like a vagabond. But as a child, I've reared you. And my eyes are on you. My eyes are on you, for you are my people. And I gave birth to you. A voice to your continent and your people. They will see you and they will see an evidence of my grace. And they will say, how did you come out? How did you come out? And you'll be better than them that loved at you and scorned you. Because you are my people. 
and I set you on mountain top as I've set Jerusalem and I've built you so that you won't be a city hidden but they will see and they will say this is the thing of God and so shall they see you here for you are in my presence my very presence and my angels are here and as I've sent the hornets ahead of my people Israel I've set them ahead of you and you will not fear the giants for my hornets goes before you and the giants will fall for my hornets will go before you they will not only fall when you take over my Canaan but they will also fall in any valley when they defy my armies and they will fall either way by the sword or by the stone still they will fall for my hornets had gone ahead of Israel and they look down upon you and they say what will his God do and what will their God do and they laughed and scorned at you and say she's done she's done she's finished but in their laughter they will see folly for I am on your side and on your right hand I stand and my name is Jehovah I'm the ancient of days I am he who was and is and is to come and I stand in the person of my son and his name is power and when his name is shouted I remember mercy when his name is shouted my spirit will guard with jealousy yes my spirit will guard with jealousy for he said I'll build my church and my spirit came and is building the church and you are the brickwork and I will not leave you I will not forsake you because you call on my name and if the sinner who sin and live a hundred years so know that it shall be well with you it's your day for your miracle it's your hand the day that your hand is moving for a turnaround and the turnaround I've given you for it's an open heaven that says the Lord Father God, you are good. How excellent is your name in all the earth. You know, in Job 38, the Bible says when God was creating the universe, the stars were singing and the angels were cheering. This is not doctrine, please. This is just me. God will give you another revelation. Because I felt today early morning like the Holy Spirit was making me hear what the angels were chanting when he said, let there be Jupiter and Mars and Mercury and Earth and, and, and the sun when he was creating and Job 30 says the angels were cheering and he made me to get a snippet of what they were saying. They were saying, oh Lord, our God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. And no matter how painful your situation is, Gogo, no matter how painful your situation is, sister. I want you to always open your eyes and say, Oh Lord, my God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. The doctor telling you, at your age, you should have been married. Your ovaries are now shrinking. You may not have children. So at least get a child and marriage will come later. Even in trying to give up, you couldn't find the child. It seemed like the door is shut against you. Oh Lord, my God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. It's a setup. Ruth is a setup. Your husband died, Ruth. It's a setup. Your mother in law doesn't have another son, Ruth, but it's a setup. Israel is not your nation, and their God is not your God, but Ruth is a setup. It's a setup. And there's a setup for you. When the battle is bigger than you, it's beyond your level and it's not yours. So we're going to sing this song before we go. Hands up. Our eyes open wide as the sun, as the sky. We lift you higher. We lift you higher. So sing the full song and we go home. Congratulations. Open heavens. Congratulations. Hands up. Hearts open. Wide as the sky, we lift you high, Lord. We lift you high, hands up, hearts open. Wide as the sky, we